your uh, enlightening remarks. Uh, a lot of good background, a lot of good history, a lot of good uh, information that many, many people don't know. Um, the reason I came tonight was not because I didn't know all that stuff. I know most of it. Uh, most of it is widely available, either on the internet or through various journals. The student history of the student of international law. Um, so I know a lot of that stuff. What I was here tonight for was to find out what the heck does anybody plan on doing about this? <laughs> and that question is directed to that gentleman in the back of the room who speaks for Robert Hurt. And I would like to know, what does Robert Hurt plan to vote on a resolution? Not asking these guys, asking you. Uh, that don't speak for him, listen for him. But... Well, you are, what is your, your title in his office? Uh, director of the Director of? Outreach. 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 All right, reach out to us. Tell us what you think he's going to do. Well, uh, he has uh, great reservations. Uh, I can't tell you how he's going to vote because, to my knowledge, he hasn't decided how he's going to vote. Would you tell us whether you plan on carrying back to him the number of hands that are ready to well, it? That's why I'm okay. Let's it. show him again. How many hands are against his <laughs> I see it. All right, got him? Yeah. All right. And, and I can say that, you know, over the last uh, week or so, we've had a good deal of traffic in, in phone calls, uh, uh, emails, and, uh, and faxes. And you can imagine the proportion they're in. And the I can't. I didn't like here. Tell right. us. It, it's overwhelming. All right. <laughs> Congressman Hurt represents the people of this district. The traffic is overwhelmingly against. Would you like to place a guess on how we think he should vote? <laughs> well, the, the other thing that, that, that I find interesting is um, the, I think, Joe, you were mentioning that so many cross currents in Syria. Uh, we're not in Syria. Uh, oh, we're we're not in not in Syria. Syria. Thank you for giving him the floor, but let's hear what he has to say. And I was drawing an analogy, if I can continue, that there are so many political cross currents in this country. And so I think it's a mistake to presume how anyone is going to vote on the basis of their political party or where they're from in the country, that sort of thing. That's, that's the point. So uh, I, think, I think it's very much a, a, a matter of being up in the air. And um, sure, I would, contrary to what some may think, how many people call and write and phone and email, it does matter. It does. And the content matters also. I've had some interesting conversations uh, with some people who, are not, who do not share your um, predominantly uh, pacifist, you want to call it that, uh, orientation, I'm not orientation, but th th they are not people who would say war is a crime. They are people who participate in war, and they are very reluctant. So it's interesting the the comments we get are, are not just put me down, check check me in this column, but there are a lot of interesting um, messages he received. Uh, so I mean, he said that there are a lot of unanswered questions. You know, and when we were, when David was mentioning the, uh, the the politics of this. If there had not been the demand for Congress, for the President to consult with Congress, we probably wouldn't be having this debate. It'd probably be over by now. Oh, that was political cover, and we all know it. But it would probably be over by now. <laughs> so, so, Scott, what does the Congressman want to know that he considers an unanswered question? What are his concerns that are leaving him undecided? I can't, I can't enumerate them all. I think, I think they're all the same things that we shared here. For instance, uh, Joe was saying, what's, what's the uh, short-term objective and, and what's the end game? I, I, we haven't heard any of that. Uh, it, that's the sort of thing. So, you know, I can't say that there's anything, there's any singular um, one item that has to be answered, but there, I mean, he's, I think to say that there are many unanswered questions says that I'm not convinced. So is he undecided about even voting for an open-ended, limitless war that could involve ground troops? Is there anything he's decided would be too much? I can't answer that. I can tell you that uh, FireDogLake.com has a uh, whip count where they're keeping track of how people are voting in the House. Uh, and Mr. Hurt's name is not even on it. He hasn't even stated a position. Yeah, there are a dozen whip counts, including Fire Dog Lakes, and he's not mentioned on any of them. Well, that's my Appar point. I apparently no one has seen a public comment even leaning one way or the other from Congressman Hurt, uh, unlike a growing number of his colleagues. So it would be... Uh, 
hundred some are other congressmen that are making their positions known one way or another. Okay, let's go to the next person. I'd like to know what the procedure would be to try to get a referendum in this country to find out exactly what the country thinks. Have we ever done that before? Can it be done? Well, you know, in the 1930s, the Ludlow Amendment was nearly put into the Constitution, which would have given more powers to the public. You would have had to have a public referendum before launching a war. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt uh, effectively killed that, uh, and World War II was declared the day after Pearl Harbor, and we've had lots of wars since without even the formality of a declaration. Um, you, you, Still can amend the Constitution. The, the way to do it, it remains what's been in the Constitution from the start. Uh, but we can also bring public pressure to bear in the, in the urgent crisis that we're in uh, and press our Congress members to at least explain to us why they aren't hearing our voices. Uh, and, and I think we have actually a very good chance uh, of winning this vote, which means preventing the vote from happening in the House. I'm not concerned about their hearing our voices. I don't think they're listening. I think they go ahead and decide whatever they want to decide in the end. I meant the same thing you meant. Oh, that's a good website. Uh, Hang on one second. Go ahead. Regarding the uh, referendum you're asking about, Mike Gravel, former senator from Alaska, put one out there. It's N4ID. That's the new, let's see, N4ID. Something like a new, new initiative for democracy. NI4D. So check that out if you're interested in reference. So I, wanna, I just want to piggyback on something that Scott said, which was very important, which is that Congressman Hurd is not hearing just from people who may be opposed to war in general, but the fact that there are many conservatives, Republicans, veterans, maybe active duty uh, soldiers and sailors, Marines that are speaking out against this war is, is absolutely, that's huge. And, and all of us have friends or family members or coworkers or neighbors or colleagues that may not be liberal Charlottesville Democrats. Um, but uh, you know, my parents, for instance, are conservative Republicans. They're opposed to this attack. I think we need to be reaching out to people who do share the congressman's politics and encourage them uh, not just, he doesn't, it's not enough for him to hear from us. He needs to be hearing from his natural base. Um, and that's he also gonna, needs to speak to them. Well, absolutely, but he needs to be hearing from, he from all of us, across the spectrum. And so please encourage people to reach out to the comments. Very good. Isham, did you have a question? And then over here, and then... Yeah, I'd like to add one more point. Uh, the reason that uh, they, we should oppose the interference and uh, the attack on Syria is very simple. Because we like freedom. If you like freedom, you stay away from there. The reason all the warmongers and the superpower want to interfere is the same reason that the thug used chemical weapons all the, and to kill his own people, because he's losing the war. The reason they want to interfere now, even though, where were they when he was killing 100,000 people? I didn't hear anybody complaining. Or one third of the population is displaced. Or he used napalm or all kind of chemical, small chemical weapons, or scans, or white phosphor on his cities and bombed them with planes and airplanes and tanks. Where were they after all that right now because he killed uh, like a thousand or so, 1,500 in chemical, where were they before? There's only one difference right now. It's the same reason he called him because he's losing the war. And if you interfere, you're gonna change the balance of the war somehow to his advantage so he can survive war. If you like freedom, if you like the thug and the dictators to fall, you stay away from it because you don't want to change the dynamics. And I also like to add one people who said the revolution is this, that has bad elements. Maybe you should go back to history and read the British or the English Revolution, see how many chopped hair were there, how many bare bodies were there, even the United States Revolution. It was messy. So people didn't choose to go and fight because they have to. And people sitting here in their condition, oh, you defend yourself the way I don't like it, I'm gonna call you a terrorist. That's, that's, that's demeaning and anti-freedom. If you like freedom and you like people fighting for their lives against all the odds, you stay away so they can finish their fight and win. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. You know, as I've heard you talk, the people here who are more familiar with the situation on the ground in Syria, I was thinking back to some of the reporting, you know, that I heard, uh, you know, on the radio uh, from Arab Spring, especially like in Egypt, 
where it seemed like the people in Egypt were so excited about democracy, and more than we are in our country, really, uh, at the time. And, you know, the situation has devolved there, and certainly whatever flowering there, there might have been um, in Syria seems to have been cut off uh, right at the start of their revolution. And it leaves me wondering what it is that we can do in this country to support people who are um, seeking peaceful means and, you know, whether it's education, whether it's citizen-to-citizen -citizen type efforts or, you know, I mean, there's a certain degree of like, well, you know, it's their country, we shouldn't meddle and, you know, like try to direct them in their politics, and, you know, that kind of thing. But I think sometimes people need tools about how to talk, how to meet, how to deal with conflict and stuff like that. And, you know, that's just a natural, like, there are, I think there are some, there is some degree of evolution in human thinking about that. And, you know, there are, there may be some things that at least some people in democratic countries that have more experience with these processes could offer, and we haven't done it really well. Um, and I just wonder, you know, like if, any, if there's any thinking here in, uh, on the dais or in the audience about what it is that we can do to support people who are moving in more positive directions than the governments are. <coughs> I would just say um, the, the best thing we can do is try to build the very best kind of a democracy we can here at home. And that until we've done that, all the preaching and all the people who go out and do you know, democracy promotion paid for by the U.S. government, in, I mean, that's all airy-fairy so long as we have such problems in our democracy and in our society here at home. You know, as long as we have what is it, 1.3 million people incarcerated, you know, and we have, what is, the, what is the proportion of people that take part in elections in this country? What is the control that ordinary people have over, you know, whether government funds get put into roads and bridges and schools and hospitals and things that the community needs, and what proportion of government funds get put, gets put into the military industrial complex? I mean, we need to seize our democracy here and then, in a way like the Norwegians or others internationally who give help to Democrats elsewhere, you can do it with a degree of credibility. But I think right now, when the U.S. government promotes democracy abroad, people just roll their eyes. You watch Al Jazeera in English now and they report on incredible human rights abuses in U.S. prisons and so forth, and you think, they didn't propose to bomb Washington. You know, they left that out. There was the, where was the solution? Right? Because that, of course, is not the solution to human rights abuses. And I, I spoke with, there are very good people in the U.S. government who mean well, including people doing actual humanitarian aid, not humanitarian bombs, including in Syria. And they are afraid that when the missiles go into Syria, uh, it's going to be impossible to continue that work, uh, and the disaster is going to to multiply. Um, so we we have to sort of first first do no harm, first stop bombing people, uh, and and then and droning people, and, and yeah, with drones or manned airplanes or cluster bombs or acceptable civilized weapons like depleted uranium and napalm, what, whatever form it is, stop doing it. Um, Let's, let's try and get a few more questions, and I, then I have a, a proposal for something we could do uh, tomorrow or the next day. So, one, two, three, four. Okay, that, that may do it. Concise, pithy questions. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know, um, you just mentioned basically the lack of involvement that the majority of our nation has, especially in international affairs. We, as a country, don't really care a lot about what's going on. So yes, we have our polls and we have, I guess, some type of community-based scouting, but we know that the majority of Americans don't really care about what's going on. What kind of information, apart from uh, basically appeasing to somebody's moral compass or asking them to just try and connect with someone, say they truly don't care, are there any other, is there any other form of information that you can give a lay person um, who doesn't know anything about the subject and say this should be important to you? Because well, my opposition to Syria is pretty much solely based on its 
a resource that the country, there's so many other things like you referenced with incarceration or education. There's a ton of other issues that can be dealt with. So going to Syria to me just doesn't make sense right now. But is there any other information that can be given to the general population that would never be in this room at all, where they would, you know, say, okay, this is something we should do. So how about we take these four questions and then we all uh, and then we all answer them and, and make some final remarks. So for you. Yeah, so I lived in uh, Israel slash Palestine for 20 years, and I think that the best information we can have is to take it, all, all of this in context. We usually talk about all these conflicts with Middle Eastern countries as if they're each one separate and only in this period of time, and actually they have a whole, whole historical context. And the first uh, CIA-initiated coup was in Syria in 1951, so that's where I mean, and our, our involvement goes back as far as colonial times, but like, if, you, if you want to look at how we got to the point today and how our, our moves will be interpreted, we have to see it in context of that, because they haven't forgotten, even if most of us never even knew it. They know, they have a history with us. It's not, it didn't start yesterday. Another thing is that I never even understood what was going on in spite of living in the area for so long until I understood American foreign policy is based on um, a greed for resources and power. And it's a whole geopolitical strategy that is not just one country by itself. It's, 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 a, it's a worldwide strategy. It's been going on for decades. And it's happening throughout Democratic and Republican administrations. So I think that's really the scary part. And you talk about, is this all an accident? Or, or is there any or is there a plan behind it? There is a plan behind it. And it's quite frightening, and it's well underway, and has been going unstopped for ge for generations already. And for Americans to just sit back, right, like like Chuck says, in the air condition, and say, "Well, you know, look at it like a football game, and what are we going to do now? Where do we've been doing it?" And I think that's where we need to understand, and that's what will give the whole argument a different a different context. Yeah. Who was number three? Yeah. Right. I was just going to make a comment about, you know, I'm not that old, but I've seen all this happen so many times, you know, and like this book on the, on the table here, you know, all these wars that we have in even our recent history are just full of lies, and um, I just thought it, was, it would be unfortunate if we left here tonight without at least commenting on not, not the ways, the political scenarios, potential political scenarios are, are ways we can engage politicians to affect you know, history. And it would, be un it would be unfortunate if, if we just commented on that because the powers that rule you know, the institutions that rule this country are, are so self-interested and so power-hungry that we can't really rely on what we can do with them. And um, you know, there's genocide basic to this country's birth. Buffy St. Mary saying, and you know, this book, it tells us the whole way through that it's just nothing but brutality and violence underneath a veneer of civility. And, and um, I, think, I think that all that, that the spirit, that power that, that rules the country, it seeps through in all these different ways through the media, and it's smeared over everyone in here. You know, we're all smeared with this nasty, you know, spirit of consumption and self-interest and and power lust you know and and it's not and not until there's like on the individual basis there's like this massive conversion and radical departure from the american way of life it's like the american way of life where this is the this is the world power this is the imp, the, the 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 present empire that rules the world and it's just like it's filtering out onto us it's spewing out onto us every day of our lives <laughs> You know, and, and um, there's, there's so many things, there's so many like small things, I think, in our individual lives that we can do every day, rather than just, you know, trying to, to um, convince um, Mr. Hurt that, you know, there's so many things, and I won't, I won't get into all the things, I think many of them are obvious, but I, I think that, I just wanted to at least draw attention to that, as well as these other things that we've been talking about. Thank you. Well, that being said, even so, can we leave here tonight with tangible action steps, which I think they've finished?
Sheridan's, but um, I, I just, I do want to convince Mr. Hurd, and I feel like he hasn't heard, heard enough, that it isn't just that he hasn't been listening, which may be true as well, but I do feel like our voices, you know, matter, and, and I have to believe that. And I, I feel like um, a lot of us worked really, really hard, maybe both times, to get Obama elected, and then after that, it was kind of like, oh, thank God, you're in office, we can, we can rest now, we deserve that rest. And yet, I feel like we kind of abandoned him a little bit, you know, because we didn't really have his back so much. So, so, and, and the other thing is when, when you spoke, yeah, when you spoke about our history, you know, our shameful history in this country, it's really true in terms of warmongering. And yet, we have, we have amazingly noble history in this country, which we, which we need to remember, especially this year, this 50th anniversary of all, all, so many civil rights events. And this coming month, we have the anniversary of the Birmingham bus, um, Birmingham 16th Street Baptist, Baptist Church bombing, in which the response of that community to those four girls getting killed, you know, which could have been a typical reaction to terrorism of, you know, revenge and violence. And instead, the people of Birmingham, those leaders and those activists there, decided they were going to push through this Civil Rights Act. It was going to, voting, sorry, Voting Rights Act. And it was a, sl a long, deliberate, you know, long-range vision of something that unfortunately, you know, happens to have been pretty much eviscerated this year. However, those, the 50 years, the changes that happened as a result, as a result of that because of a community being, having this vision from Gandhi, from King and others of the possibilities of a deliberate response to terror, terrorist acts with violence, I mean with non-violence. So can we, can we carry, can we feel proud of that legacy in our country that the whole world saw, you know, th during those, during those weeks of the Children's Crusade and all those events in, in the Civil Rights Movement, and can we, can we build on that today? This year, 50 years ago. Anybody want to respond to any of those things? Do you want to go first? <laughs> 